you to open up your Bibles to the book of Matthew in chapter 12, we're going to be turning and reading the majority of scriptures that we want to consider this morning. So I encourage you to have a Bible open and handy. We are basing our lesson this morning off of a text in John chapter 20. And this will be one of the few scriptures that we have up on the screen this morning. But in John chapter 20, as you recall here, this is after Jesus had risen from the dead. And he had made several appearances to different ones. But previous to the context here, he had appeared to the eleven disciples. And Thomas, as you recall, wasn't present at that time. And so in John 20, verse 24, we read, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. And so he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And so that phrase there that Thomas uttered, I will not believe, is the thing that we want to consider for a short time this morning together. There are many these, these days that simply will not believe, and there's a number of different reasons for which that is the case. We want to consider some of the possible reasons, and then of course use the Word of God to show how such reasons really don't hold any water, and we can show how the Word of God is true and how we have every reason to indeed believe in the Word of God and in Jesus Christ, His Son. So I will not believe unless, that is the title of our lesson. Unless what? Well, some people seek after a sign. And if you have your Bibles open there to Matthew chapter 12, we read an example of this. And of course, this is not the only place that we read about individuals who were seeking after some kind of a sign. And the ironic thing, of course, is that Jesus, throughout His ministry performed all kinds of miraculous signs to confirm that the things that he were, uh, was teaching were indeed from God and that he himself was from God, that these were not just the uh, ideas of some new man that came onto the scene with some new kind of perspective on life, on, on God, but this was indeed from God. But here in Matthew chapter 12, we have an example. Despite all that Jesus had done, they wanted something more, some kind of an additional sign or uh, miraculous thing to take place to finally convince them that they ought to pay attention and believe in the things that were being taught. Matthew chapter 12 and beginning in verse 38, it says, Some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You think about the ultimate sign that we have been given as far as, well, why should we believe anything that Jesus said? Why should we believe anything in the New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter? Well, the ultimate sign is just what Jesus identified here. And of course, at this point, it hadn't yet taken place. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ confirms who He is. It confirms that everything He taught is indeed from God and is true. And as we look at the life of Christ and we see all the different times that he quoted from Scripture, which would be contained in the Old Testament, not only do we have confirmation that what we have in the New Testament is from God, but we have verification of the fact that what is in the Old Testament is also indeed from God. Let's go over here to the book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And here Paul spends a few moments reasoning about the wisdom of men versus the wisdom of God and how far superior God's wisdom is. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 18 there, Paul says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. He asks, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom, so-called, did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And notice again in verse 22, the Jews request a sign constantly. And even after Christ had risen, as his apostles went forth to establish the church and to preach the message of the cross, constantly the Jews were, well, we need something else. We need some kind of a sign, even despite all that had been done. So the Jews request a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, it is a stumbling block. To the Greeks, it is foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. In verse 25, he says, the foolishness of God, not that the knowledge of God is in any way foolishness, but of course, this is how the world would view it. But notice the foolishness, so-called, of God is wiser than men. And the weakness, so-called, of God is stronger than men. We must understand, of course, that in our day and age, that miraculous signs like what Jesus would have performed and his apostles following after him as they had gifts of the Holy Spirit, those things have ceased. They had a time in which they were required and they were needed, and we're going to notice the scripture that explains that for us. We're also going to see, though, that that time has passed, that the purpose of those things, more or less, was to confirm the word being preached, and then once that word was written down in its entirety, in its completeness, there was no longer a need for such things. And that's explained over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if you turn just a few pages over there. And we typically come to this chapter to reason about the idea of love, and Paul spends quite a a good deal of time in this chapter explaining the superiority of love, and the necessity of love and how love never fails, as he says there in verse 8. And starting there, he says, whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Now, in the context, in the larger context here, we understand that Paul has been talking quite a bit about spiritual gifts and Some of those gifts included the gift of prophesying, the gifts of knowledge, uh, the gifts of speaking in other tongues or languages. And so in chapter 13, he's kind of taking a break here and trying to get them to see that there's something more excellent, something that everyone can attain to, even if they haven't been given a gift of the Spirit. And that, of course, is love. But he's coming back to this idea that there's a temporary aspect to these other gifts. And... He says these things are going to vanish away eventually. He says we know in part and we prophesy in part. In other words, they each had the ability to reveal certain pieces and parts and then working together collectively as the church, uh, the entirety of God's will could be manifested and known by all. But notice in verse 10 he says when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And the perfect, of course, references the perfect law of liberty, as James references there in James chapter 1. And so when the complete revelation of God has been uh, revealed and recorded, then these pieces and parts will no longer be required. And so verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we'll be face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And he concludes the chapter there. Now abides faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so again, as we come back here to Mark chapter 16, we see explained to us 
why they had these gifts at all. Mark chapter 16. And notice with me there uh, the last couple of verses of the chapter. Verse 19 beginning, he says, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God and they went out and they preached everywhere. And the Lord, notice, worked with them. You recall how they had been promised the Holy Spirit. But notice, how did he work with them? Well, by confirming the word through, notice, the accompanying signs. And so the purpose of all those things was to confirm, ultimately, the word that was preached. And that is what we have today. We must understand, of course, that as such, Scripture is all-sufficient for us in producing faith, believing, uh, trusting faith that leads to salvation. We have all the evidence that we could ever want or need to be able to be satisfied and be pleasing to God. Uh, over here in Luke chapter 16, a place that maybe we don't think to go when talking about these types of things, but I think it uh, makes a very good point. Here in Luke chapter 16, uh, we have, of course, this story of the rich man and Lazarus. And we'll not read the, in, the entirety of uh, the whole account there for the sake of time this morning. But starting in verse 19 is where that begins, and it goes down through the end of chapter 16. But to summarize the first part of the story, you recall how there was this rich man, and then there was also this poor man named Lazarus. And the indication, of course, is that one was righteous despite being physically poor or materially poor, while the rich man was poor in spirit. Or in other words, he didn't consider faith or righteousness or those types of things important in his life. And so while the one suffered in this life, ultimately in the next life, as he was carried by the angels, we're told there, into Abraham's bosom, in that Hadean realm, he finds himself in a place of comfort and, and rest. Whereas the rich man, who was consumed with his riches and his temporary fleeting things, finds himself in a place of torment. And so there's this gulf that's fixed between the two. They can't pass from one side to the other. And this rich man is, is in torment, he's in flame, and he's, he's begging Abraham, please allow just a, a drop of water. To, to come upon my tongue, that I might have just a, a moment of relief from this misery. And so over the course of the discussion there that he has, the, the rich man begins to think about his brethren that are yet alive on the earth. And he recognizes, of course, you know, they're kind of in the same boat that I was in. They're not thinking about spiritual things. They're not worried about God or serving God. And so he starts to think about, well, I can't be saved, obviously. I can't get myself out of this situation, but perhaps there's some way that they could be spared from coming to this same place. So looking at verse 27, as you pick up there in the text, he says, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him, that is Lazarus, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, well, they have Moses, notice this, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But verse 31, he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Now, the ironic thing about all this is that today, what do we have? Well, we have one who has risen from the dead, don't we? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We have the empty tomb, and how do we explain that? How do we explain away the empty tomb? Men have come up with all kinds of theories, none of which hold water based upon the historical accounts and inspired accounts at that that we have. There's no way to explain it away other than this man rose from the dead. But yet how many people still with that stubborn out? And cross their arm, well, I won't believe. And so it's, it's much the same situation as we see kind of mirrored here in this account. 
Well, we have Moses and the prophets, not that we have just the Old Testament. Of course, we have the New Testament, but we have the evidence, in other words. We can look and read and see what the truth is. Are we going to pay attention to it? We've been given a sign, the ultimate sign. Back over here in John chapter 20, of course, we had read from this chapter at the beginning of the lesson, as you recall, where Thomas was saying, well, I need some physical evidence. I need to physically put my hands on them before I'm going to be willing to believe. Of course, ultimately, it was granted to him to be able to do that. But you recall how Jesus uh, more or less rebuked him and said uh, there um, in verse 29, Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And Jesus wasn't saying, well, those that just have blind faith and just kind of say, well, that sounds like a good idea, that sounds nice, so I'll just believe that. And I think that that's evidence in the next two verses there. Notice, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but notice verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. In other words, we have the evidence before us. These things were written so that we might believe. We don't have to have physically seen him and touched him as Thomas did because we have the evidence right before our eyes. But will we pay attention to it? Of course, 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about the sufficiency of Scripture. Uh, it's breathed out by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for uh, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete or perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Well, what else? What other reasons do men have for not believing? Well, some are looking for a show. Some are looking to be impressed by the speaker or by the presentation that is given during a service. And we see all kinds of examples of that today, don't we, as we look around about us. It's not so much about honoring God and praising God when people come together in the name of God, supposedly. But it's about, well, I'm going to sit here and be entertained. Bring this band in and, and bring some, some food in and, and different things so that I can sit here and more or less like watching the television. You know, we sit there and we do those things from time to time to entertain ourselves and to relax. And so many people have that type of a mindset today. They're looking for uh, some kind of a show, some kind of an impressive display to persuade them to put stock into a certain set of beliefs. I want us to notice some scriptures to that end. Over here, once again, in the book of 1 Corinthians, come with me there to chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, we all look to Paul quite frequently, don't we, as an example, as somebody we look up to and, and somebody who had a God-given wisdom I want us to notice what he says here about how he spoke. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, he says, I, brethren, when I came to you, notice, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What was Paul's estimation of his ability to, to speak? Well, he says, you know, I'm not some great speaker. You know, I didn't stand up there and and impress you with my vocabulary and, and say all these things that just moved you with emotion and and you just, well, I've got to follow this guy. No, they were moved. They were prompted to respond because it was the truth. In 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 6, 
We find Paul here stating, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. What's the important thing? The important thing is the truth being declared. Having a knowledge of the truth and not so much having this elaborate display to correspond with that. Back here in the book of Acts in chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, beginning there in verse 24, we read about somebody who did have a great ability to speak. And and it's noted here in the text. But I want us to notice something else about this man as well. Acts chapter 18 and verse 24, beginning, we read that there was a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures. And he came to Ephesus. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord. But notice, though, he knew only the baptism of John. So his knowledge wasn't complete. So he was speaking eloquently, and he was speaking the truth, by and large, right? But yet it wasn't the whole truth. There was still a piece that was missing for him. And so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but notice in verse 26 that when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now what does that teach us? It teaches us that just because somebody's up here and and speaking so wonderfully and they sound like they really know what they're talking about doesn't mean they're always going to tell us the whole truth. Not necessarily, on, as we think about Apollos, that he was intending to deceive anybody, but nonetheless, he didn't have the complete picture. And so it needed to be explained to him more perfectly. And we can find all kinds of examples today. You turn on your television on Sunday morning and you can find all kinds of men, and women for that matter, that speak very eloquently. And their message is, is very moving and inspiring even at times. But is it the truth? That's what counts. You recall back here in Acts chapter 4, as it's written concerning the apostles, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13, specifically speaking of Peter and John, as the Jews who were their enemies, they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They perceived, notice that they were uneducated And they were untrained men. And they marveled. Now here are these two guys. We might call them country bumpkins to maybe make some kind of analogy for us today. You know, maybe they they didn't get a a full high school education. They never went to college. You know, somebody lives out here in the hills. We might think of somebody like that. And they're up here and they're speaking. And they're bold and they're knowledgeable of what they're speaking about. And we're thinking, well, how are these... How did they train themselves to be able to do this? But notice they realized that they had been with Jesus. And so it's unimportant the display or the speech, whether or not somebody uses correct pronunciation of all the words or... um, uses the correct tense of their verbs or whatever it is. The important thing is that the truth is being taught. And if we're seeking after something other than that, then there's a problem. I will not believe unless everyone else feels the same way. What about that one? You know, that's a a popular mindset in our day and age. People want to go along with the crowd. And I shouldn't say that It's just characteristic of our day and age because we see it down through the pages of history. It seems to be almost human nature that we want to go along with the crowd. Whatever the majority is doing, well, that's what we'll do. We don't want to be the odd man out. We don't want to be the the only one doing something different because then, well, that ushers in ridicule and that ushers in people persecuting us and different things of that nature. And so some people just simply won't believe because, well, it's just not very popular. Well, there's not a lot of people that believe in God anymore, are there? That's kind of one of those things that they did, you know, back in the old days. You know, science has disproved all that, right? 
And so people just follow the crowd. But notice here in Matthew chapter 7, what Jesus had to say about that type of an idea. In verse 13, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And notice, there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And so the characteristic of those who have a believing, uh, obedient faith in God is that there's, there's few of them. And so if we're going to follow God, we're not going to be amongst the majority, sadly. Of course, God's will is that all would come to a knowledge of the truth and repent. But that is not the reality of things. Back here in the book of Galatians, in chapter 6, I want us to notice a few verses here at the beginning of this sixth chapter. Paul says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And notice specifically verses 4 and 5, he says, Let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For notice, each one shall bear his own load. In other words, what it all ultimately is going to boil down to is we're all responsible for ourselves. The actions that we choose to engage in, the things we choose to believe in, the words we choose to speak, Nobody else is forcing us to do anything. We are in complete control of ourselves. And so it doesn't matter if, well, I'm doing what all these other people were doing, and I thought it was the right thing. It seemed like the good thing to do at the time. Well, so what? If it's the wrong thing, then it doesn't matter, does it? We can't rely on the majority. In Philippians chapter 2, and verse 12, notice the warning here or the encouragement, we might say, that Paul gives. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And it's not to, not to say that we're not concerned with other people, or we're not trying to help other people, and that's, of course, brought out in the, the previous text we noticed there in Galatians 6, where we are to bear one another's burdens and help each other along. But ultimately, we are each accountable for our own selves. And so we have to ask ourselves, Am I going to do what's right? Am I going to follow the truth? Or am I going to do what everybody else is doing just for the sake of blending in? What's going to be the case at the end of time? Will it be well with my soul? I will not believe unless it's convenient. That's another, another one. You know, Somebody who comes to services week after week, they never miss. They're always at Bible study. They hear the truth taught. They know the truth. But for whatever reason, they just feel like, well, today's not the day. Uh, I've got something going on later this afternoon. I really don't want to have to change my clothes and, and you know, go through all that to be baptized. Uh, maybe later on when a, a more convenient time is, is available, then I'll address these things that need to be done. You know, that's not a, a new idea either. So over here in Acts chapter 24... We read about somebody who had that same type of a, a mindset as it pertained to his obedience to the gospel. Over here in Acts 24, and looking at verse 24, we read that after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as Paul reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, notice Felix was afraid, he, he trembled. We might say he was cut to the heart, to borrow the language from Acts chapter 2. But rather than respond and say, maybe I should address these things and take care of these things, he answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, then I will call for you. And so for whatever reason, Felix didn't feel that it was the right time. It, was, it wasn't convenient for him to respond to these truths that were being explained to him by the Apostle Paul. Well, when is the right time? When is the convenient time? That's really what it boils down to. 
You know, when we have this type of a mindset, there's always an excuse. It's never going to be the convenient time because what it boils down to is I'm just not ready to make the commitment for whatever reason. People are always trying to make things convenient. It uh, seems like in the wrong sense. And we see an example of that back here in the book of 1 Kings. You recall how uh, the sons of Solomon, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, uh, divided the nation of Israel into the northern and southern kingdoms. And Jeroboam, of course, became king of the northern tribes. But he was fearful as these things had just happened and this division had just occurred. He was fearful about, well, what's going to happen when it comes time, uh, for example, for the observance of the Passover? And the instruction is, you go to Jerusalem. Well, that's, that's in Judah, and that's where Rehoboam, and if the people go back there, then, well, they might be swayed, and they might turn against me, and they might turn back to my brother. He didn't want that. So he devised this plan to make it convenient for the people to not have to go and do things in the way that God had prescribed them to be done, but he created his own high places, his own holy places that the people could go and worship and supposedly accomplish the will of God and not have to travel down into Judah to do it. Notice just a few verses from the context here. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 28, it says, The king asked advice, and he made two calves of gold and said to the people, Notice, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. That's, that's a lot of work. You know, that's a long journey. It's just too much. So here are your gods, O Israel. And we'll, let's just say, these are your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let's just pretend, for the sake of convenience, that this is reality. And he set up one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. He made shrines on the high places and made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. He goes on to talk about how he set his own holy days and his own feast days and, and different things of this nature. Basically just invented whatever he wanted because it's easier. It's more appealing for whatever reason. And people do the same type of thing today. Well, I know God said this, but for whatever reason, this seems easier. It's much easier to not have to wake up and, and put on nice clothes and, and drive to services, so I'll just turn the TV on and watch this program and feel like I'm right with God. And please don't misunderstand. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody or put anybody down, but we're talking about serious things here. We're talking about your soul and your salvation. Over here in Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, uh, beginning there in verse 24. And Jesus basically just lays it all out and says, Look, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be right with me and with God, it's not necessarily going to be convenient for you at all points in your life. There's, there's going to be some some challenges, and there's going to be some things you have to give up. But it's going to be worth it. That's the ultimate point. He says there in verse 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world, but then loses his own soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and He will reward each according to His works. I will not believe unless it's what I want to believe. And I think that that's really what it all probably boils down to. Even these other things that we've been talking about, it really just comes down to, well, what do we want? What, what does Devin want? What does Rick want? Are we going to ultimately desire what God wants and, and mesh those desires 
Or are we going to persist in our selfishness and say, well, yeah, I know that's what God wants. I know that's what God says, but really I just want to do what I want to do. I want to hear what I want to hear. I want to practice what I want to practice. Over here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Second Timothy chapter 4, the first four verses there. Timothy is charged by Paul. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Notice verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires... Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and they will be turned aside to fables. And so many today have been turned aside to fables because it sounds appealing. It, it tickles their ears. It's what they want. In Second Thessalonians... Just a few pages back there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9 beginning. See if this doesn't sound like the times that we live in. Uh, he says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. Notice signs and lying wonders. You know, there's some today that supposedly perform miracles and perform signs. And they lead many astray with those things. There was a, uh, a quote, I'm sure you've probably seen it around. It's been around for a while. Uh, but it basically says, there's a reason that you don't see psychics winning the lottery. And it's the same reason that you don't see faith healers working in hospitals. It's because it's, it's not authentic. It's not true. It's a lying wonder. Verse 10, he continues, With all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth. And that's what it really boils down to. Do we love the truth? Are we interested in the truth? Or are we interested in whatever my version of the truth is? The truth will save, as he says there in verse 10. Verse 11, For this reason God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God's not going to force us against our will. You know, that's the beauty of who we are and the way that we're created in the image of God. We have the ability to have free will and make decisions. If we didn't have a choice in the matter, we'd just be robots, wouldn't we? God doesn't want robots. He wants those that would willingly and, and humbly serve Him because they love Him and they, they desire that. But if we persist in these other things, God's not going to, to, against our will, pull us back out of that. Romans chapter 3 and looking at verses 3 and 4. He says there, what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? He says, certainly not indeed. And this is what we want to focus on. Verse 4, notice, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. God is true. And if we want to be true, and we want to be amongst those who are following truth, and we've got to deny ourselves and we've got to submit to Him. So what about you and I this morning? Are we persisting in unbelief for the reasons that we've been talking about or, or some other reason? I think we've seen uh, the foolishness of such a mentality, such a perspective on things. And I hope that these have been helpful to the end that we might give up self and embrace the grace of God. A couple final closing passages here, or verses. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 8, notice the apostle writes there and says, Therefore he who rejects this, in other words, the message that he's 
declaring the gospel ultimately, does not reject man, notice, but God. If you reject the the lesson that we've looked at this morning, it's not that you're rejecting me because we've verified what we've spoken this morning using the word of God. And so you're rejecting God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Galatians 4 and verse 16, recall there, Paul asked the question. He's been trying to persuade uh, these individuals and try and get them to see the, the light, the truth. And he asked the question, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And you know, sometimes the truth hurts because it steps on our toes and it gets us to recognize that, hey, I'm, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And we don't want to hear that. <laughs> we don't want to have to admit that. But again, we're talking about our soul and our spirit. We're talking about where are we going to spend eternity. And that's worth a little bit of hurt sometimes. If it's going to prompt us then to make the needed changes that will allow us to be with God throughout all eternity. Through a relationship with His Son. And so this morning if you're here and and you recognize a need... Uh, in regards to making your life right and being able to walk out these doors today with a valid hope of eternity, then why not do that this morning? Why not put aside any excuses or false reasonings and embrace the truth of God, embrace the gift of His Son? If you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel, we would implore you to... uh, Be willing to confess Christ this morning, to repent of your sins, to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If you're here and you're a Christian and you have wandered astray in some way and need to come back, then please do that. We would love to pray with you and pray for you. If you have that need this morning, please let it be known while we stand together and while we sing.